We're back with Ambassador J. William Middendorf, and sir, this has been fascinating. We were talking about the geopolitical ambitions of both Russia and China. Can we talk just a little bit about what their capabilities are? I mean, one of the first questions that comes to my mind when we think about uh, the economies of each, and especially Russia's being a bit fragile, um, are they in a position to sustain a general war? You recall that the Soviet um, uh, gross national product was just a fraction of ours and a fraction of Germany's. Uh, uh, but uh, if you spend 60% of your gross national product on weapons systems and projecting power, and, uh, uh, and the hell with the population and their needs, which is what the communists did during the Cold War, uh, then, uh, then the economy means nothing. They're just going to obviously, and look at North Vietnam. They're spending uh, an outrageous amount of their gross national product on in North Korea. I mean, North Korea on being able to project power, um, developing this new, these new warheads and nuclear warheads and what have you, and submarine launched. So the answer in both of these totalitarian states is yes. Yeah. What does it look like for us? The, the thing, the thing to remember is that the Vietnam War. It was seven or eight, nine years. Uh, the uh, Iraqi war and this Middle Eastern war is, is even longer. It's now 15 years. Um, World War II was three and a half to four years. Um, the next war will be, could be 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, let me give you a scenario, and, and it's one that certainly the Chinese and the Russians are thinking about. Uh, and, you know, they've joined forces now, similar to the Ribbentrop-Molotov Agreement of 1940. Um, whether they'll stay together, I don't know, but uh, it, certainly at the moment, it's, a, it's the greatest threat this country, this country or the free world has ever faced. I'm talking about from the point of view of being, them being able to project power against CONUS in the United States. The next war could easily uh, be uh, uh, a, a space-launched missile coming vertically down uh, from China to Russia, or Russia, uh, a, a, against which there's virtually no defense. Uh, it could be the beginning of a, of a of, of the war unannounced, following perhaps an EMP attack uh, over Omaha, let's say, 250 miles up with a, a simple nuclear warhead, which would knock out. 60 to 80 percent of all the utilities in this country, uh, food production would end and transportation, would everything. The Defense Department says that 80 percent of the population would be dead in nine months uh, of the U.S. population. Because uh, of the lack of infrastructure and the inability well, to survive without the, the things we're used to. The Walmart shelves would be empty in a half an hour. Yeah. And uh, uh, where is the food going to come from? So or even water, and so to speak. And uh, and shelter and what have you, uh, uh, everything would grind to a halt. Just for the audience, EMP is an electromagnetic pulse, yes. and it, it, it induces very high currents in anything electronic or electrical, and so what it would do is overload transformers, it would probably melt the uh, boards in your cell phones, uh, those sorts of, it would, it would be general destruction to anything electronic. And it's a capability that North, uh, North Korea has today, Iran has, uh, Russia and China, of course, and uh, it's a very simple uh, nuclear warhead, uh, and, they, and North Korea is moving so fast to develop a sea-launched nuclear warhead, uh, perhaps that's their ultimate goal. So uh, the, the threat of a general war is real. It could be sustained, anyone can sustain it for threat 30 is, minutes. The threat of a general war is, is, is a constant, it's mm -hmm. always there. Uh, bu uh, communism, by definition, uh, they're cowards and bullies at the same time. They're cowards when they see us strong, and they'll they'll, they'll wait their time. They're very patient, um, particularly China. Uh, and a bully when they see they have an advantage, as they saw in Crimea. Okay, so in this scenario, there are subplots. There are smaller things going on that probably are, to some extent, surrogates from the Russians and the Chinese. I'm thinking about Iran and some of their uh, well, Certainly escapades. Iran and North Korea, who are satellites of those two big powers. And uh, 
and certainly, uh, certainly the Spratleys and the and Crimea are the uh, are advanced steps uh, in the scenario of taking over the world. The last time you spoke to us, about a year ago, you suggested that the uh, Iran nuclear deal, which was just just about completed at that time, was uh, being uh, shown as it came to light to be um, completely one-sided, and uh, you felt that the uh, Iranians would violate it from day one. Has that happened, in your opinion? Of course. Violated well, before day one. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they, they essentially played along the U.S. State Department and, by extension, the White House. They're very naive, They're very naive. I mean, they wanted to leave a legacy that they made a deal, any kind of a deal. And you know yourself in life, if you make any kind of a deal, <laughs> if you're going to buy a used car and you're just bent on making a deal and buying a car, and the dealer may well take advantage of you and, and perhaps give you faulty breaks. Um, uh, is Iran, in general, in your opinion, a worse threat than North Korea? No, uh, uh, both of them are a threat. Uh, both of them are, are developing long-range missiles. Uh, Iran can certainly uh, being supplied with long-range missiles uh, by the Russians, uh, can, uh, can certainly reach uh, most of Europe uh, with a nuclear warhead uh, in time. and. Uh, uh, obviously, Europe, uh, Europe uh, is not known for its courage, so to speak. You saw how quickly they collapsed in World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, and would would they try to make an accommodation, and uh, and would the Southeast Asian countries try to make an accommodation with China? Um, uh, not un, not. Um, not impossible. For example, I met with a number of the naval attaches from, I think, 17 different Asian countries a few months back, and uh, they, uh, they all assured me that uh, if the United States st stands firm, they'll hold their coats, so to speak. Uh, I don't get the impression that uh, when the Southeast Asia Council met recently, and they didn't even mention the UN resolution condemning China. Um, so they don't want to offend China because too many trade and investment uh, correlations. So they're afraid of China, but not necessarily afraid of uh, the United States. Nobody's but, afraid of the United States. So in other words, if... And why should they be afraid of us? We're not going to attack them. Well, that, that is... I think that's the core of the problem right now. Is, is, as you said, the president and uh, his entire administration has been focused on trying to make any kind of a deal that they could point to afterwards and say, this is our legacy and, and uh, we should be the fifth face on uh, Mount Rushmore. But the, the fact of the matter is that in doing so, they've given away the store just to get a deal and maybe finding that that deal isn't, isn't worth as much as they, um, as they had hoped. Now, the demonstration of resolve for war that precedes the, the negotiations with Europe and, uh, and with the Southeast Asian countries would be a smaller version of what comes if you don't go along. I think that in Iran's case, their first target would be Israel, would it not? I don't think so. No? I don't think, uh, I, I mean, I think that uh, if, it's part, if Iran and Russia and China and North Korea's goal is to take over the world, I think they're bigger targets. <clears throat> That's interesting. On that note, what we will do is take a break for, uh, as we get ready for our final segment. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. watching. This is fantastically interesting, but right now it's time to ask the question, are you kidding me?